In the 1960s, there was an explosion of popularity for traditional gothic horror. Edgar Allan Poe was as popular then as he had been since his lifetime. And H.P. Lovecraft finally received mass market paperback editions of his work, introducing cosmic gothic horror to an entire generation. Both artists were extremely popular on college campuses where the counterculture was growing and they became symbols of a sort of outlier or outsider status. Horror was popular again and relevant to the social zeitgeist at the time. In film this was easy to see with the AIP adaptations of Poe and even a few Lovecraft titles like Haunted Palace, though that used a Poe poem ostensibly as its basis. But by far, the greatest practitioners of gothic horror and cinema came from Italy. Mario Bava's Black Sunday is without doubt the crown jewel of gothic cinema. That it bases itself not on any specific literary work, but on many, only reinforces the sign of the times. In a couple of years that would change, of course, and the focus would change in Italy from the gothic tradition to the giallo, and at that point figures such as Dario Argento and Lucio Fulci would take over the mantle from Bava. But for a brief time there, the Gothic was alive. And although I felt it was important to set the stage, we're not here to talk about the past. We're here to talk about the current and future. Specifically, the most clear inheritor of Mario Bava's legacy, Ivan Zaccone. Zaccone first burst onto the scene in 2000 with his brilliant Darkness Beyond, a micro-budgeted, extremely moody, and extremely effective film loosely based on Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos. The difference here is that while in the past the Outer Gods had only ever gotten a claw into our world, Zaccone imagined a world after the stars were right, after the return of the Old Gods, and after the fall of mankind. It's a moody, atmospheric work that is only betrayed by its budget. He addressed those budgetary shortcomings a year later with The Unknown Beyond, a superior follow-up that continues that sort of dream logic and that beauty that was emerging in his film, because that is what gothic cinema is. It is finding beauty in darkness. He continued with the Lovecraft adaptations with The Shunned House. The Shunned House is a remarkably more professional effort and is a fever dream of brilliant images and ideas that take from Lovecraft but expand. Zuccone is brilliant for using Lovecraft as the foundation of his work but not being tied to it. Now other artists like Stuart Gordon could be argued to have done the same. The difference is that you can feel Lovecraft's prose in Zuccone's work. You can feel his moody, angsty drama. And that's something that is timeless. Whereas Gordon's films, as great as they are, tend to feel firmly part of the 80s canon. It's difficult to imagine Zaccone's films feeling bound to a time. Any of his adaptations of Lovecraft could have been released in the 60s and felt at home with Mario Bava. The next two films in his canon are not Lovecraft adaptations. They are extremely different than Lovecraft, and they both ply largely on the international exploitation market. This is where we can see the spikes of influences like Argento and Fulci in his work, but he's doing something significantly different as well, something more personal, more visionary. Those works, Bad Brains and Nympha, 
are essential viewing for anyone wanting to see what can be done on a micro budget today because there's an assumption that film is expensive and we can't take chances. Both these films are big chances, even though they do neatly fit into established subgenres. Bad Brains can be seen as a sort of psychodrama, whereas Nympha is that rarest of all subgenres, non-exploitation. Coincidentally, while Nympha received a fairly robust release stateside, Bad Brains remains a harder title to get a hold of, especially with English subtitles, and that has held the film back. Still, I recommend searching it out, and even if you need to, watch it without subtitles, because the camera work is really the star. In 2008, Zucone returned to H.P. Lovecraft for inspiration for The Color from the Dark, an adaptation of The Color Out of Space. This is a story that had already been adapted twice earlier in the form of Die, Monster, Die, and The Curse, and one that has recently been adapted again under its own title, although with the English spelling of color discarded in favor of the American. This is a remarkably different film than all of the other adaptations in that it's not just an expansion of the original story, but it's a capture of the degradation of the family, which was exactly what Lovecraft had in mind. The supernatural is almost incidental to what is culturally being explored. And I think the film, although a slow burn at times, is every bit as good as Del Toro's Pan's Labyrinth, which is what I would consider it most similar to. Wrath of the Crows, Zucone's 2013 low-budget masterpiece, was exactly the sort of follow-up that we needed to cement Zucone as one of the forefront figures in the horror genre. The film is a highly experimental, but narratively clean film about a prison that might be a mental prison, might be a physical prison, might be hell. It is an unpredictable, strange work that really engages the viewer and takes us to places we haven't been before and makes us feel things that we're not comfortable feeling, nor have we ever felt before. This is a film that will add to the experiences of your life. It will make you realize that there is a lot that still can be done in film and that these ideas that everything has been done and that we are just going to repeat the same formulas with a little wrinkle here or there are absolutely incorrect. Zucone with one film manages to make a thesis statement about where the horror genre needs to go. This is a brave, passionate, important work. And although it did get a DVD release in America, it still does not enjoy the popularity or even the exposure that it deserves. Bringing us up to date, in 2017, Zucone released a serial, a brave, bold move that was born as much out of budgetary needs as it was out of the creative spirit. It again brought us back to H.P. Lovecraft, in this case, a story that is very familiar to horror fans, Herbert West, Reanimator. But whereas Gordon's earlier adaptation took the first two chapters of Lovecraft's serial and expanded them to their gruesome lengths, Zacone used the stories as a basis for something wider, something that embraced the entire Cthulhu mythos in a way that was both unexpected and quite brilliant. Now, the real star this time, there's no question about it, was that camera work. Zacone's eye for cinema is unmatched probably in the world, and certainly beyond the horror genre. It's a really vibrant film with stark, beautiful images and an unbelievable palette of colors and choices. It is undeniably a gothic masterpiece. He later re-edited the serial into a complete film, and there is a lot of expanded material in it. I think that both versions are worth watching. I do very much support the idea of the serial as a form. It was really exciting to get another chapter every once in a while and to wonder where will the next chapter take us. It reminded me of seeing Twin Peaks for the first time, whereas every engaging episode opened more and more doors, and then you'd have to wait another week to get more. A binge viewing of that type of material actually does it a disservice. But in this case, the feature version of Herbert West Reanimator is actually a great work unto itself, so I'm not telling you not to watch it. In fact, it is available on a bunch of streaming platforms only in that form. So please, search it out and don't feel bad about not having seen it in its original serial form. Ivan Zacone's career up to this point, two decades in, 
is really unmatched in Italian cinema, and, and it certainly represents one of the most visionary artists we have going. So why is it that you probably have never heard his name? Well, it has a lot to do with distribution. In the DVD days, there just wasn't a hunger for a lot of imported titles. And as we got to the Blu-ray years, we focused wildly on those 70s and 80s classics. So marketing a modern, new Italian feature was tough. You would think that people who go out of their way to collect Argento and Fulci would be drawn to this, but they'd have to know about it to be drawn to it. There isn't much press, even inside the insular horror press, the online community doesn't really talk about even Zaccone, and that's a real shame. So what does the future hold for an artist like Zaccone? I'm not sure. I'm sure there'll be more Lovecraft, but I hope there's also his original work as well, and I hope his sweaty fever dreams of films continue. I hope also that he gets an opportunity to work with larger budgets. I'd love to see him work with even more established artists, but in the meantime, if you haven't experienced any of his existing titles, I enthusiastically recommend going and doing so. Now, I know if you're a physical collector, you probably want everything on 4K or at least Blu-ray, and most of these titles are not going to be available. But do yourself a big favor. Don't reject seeing something simply because it's not receiving its best treatment in America. Because at this point, where we sit on the landscape, we need to look harder to get the good stuff.